Amen. Pray it blesses you as much as it's blessed some of us. Who's read that book in here? Have you read it? Has it blessed you? Has you read that book? Amen. Challenged you? Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Go with me to Luke chapter 15. <clears throat> um, and I'm really, I'm, I'm really excited about this uh, message today. And I want you to really like lean into it. Because remember, last week we talked about what do you see <clears throat> and the importance of many times we don't, we don't need more information. We just need a revelation, right? Because how you see yourself is often how you treat yourself. How you see other people is how you treat them. Well, many times how you see yourself is how you treat other people. And if we don't correct and fix how we see, then we'll never fix how we be. I'm going to say it again. If we don't correct and fix how we see, we'll never correct and fix how we be. We'll cycle. We'll continue to repeat the same things over and over again because our, our, our vision is skewed. And, and it's not so much that we need God to give us something new. We just need God to open our eyes so we can see what is actually before us. All right. So um, today, though, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk from... Uh, these particular parables, and I'm, I'll pull in a few other stories. Why don't you go to Luke chapter 15, and I'm going to read this, and I'm not going to try to read it too fast, but I'm not going to read it too slow because I need to read the whole chapter. But I need you to really, like, look at the text, okay? And when you see things that may even stick out to you, highlight it yourself, come back to it, underline, do whatever. Because this particular chapter reveals the heart of God, like, like Jesus is using a parable to explain how valuable we are to the Father. And I need you to really get this. Okay, I need you to really get this. So Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 1 says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners, and he eats with them. All right, he's receiving those that, that, he should, that are defiled and that should be ostracized. Now, if, he, if he really knew, and I, and, I, and I need you to think about this, Jesus saw things differently. And this is what happens when you're stuck in your carnality uh, and how you can prejudge people based upon their past or their experiences or, or you know, the, the, how they've uh, become identified with in, in the world. They're looking and they identify these people as publicans and sinners. Right. Like they like they've been around them all of their life. OK. And they're saying, listen, this guy, he, he's he's eating with them. Like he does. He not know who they are. And the truth is, he's eating with them because he knows who they are. It's whose they are. and He know who they are. That's why he is eating with them. OK. So to enlighten his critics. And I love this because anytime Jesus deals with critics, he gives a parable because only those who are pure in heart can understand what he's saying. Right. So he says. So he spoke to spoke this parable to them, saying, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety nine in the wilderness and go after the one which he lost until he finds it. And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends. Now watch this. And neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me. For I have found my sheep, which was lost. I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin and does not light a lamp, sweep the house. Y'all ever lost like 10 cent or a dime like you? But here he says, who loses a coin? And she cuts on the lights and begins to sweep the house, desperately searching. He says, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. He desperately searches. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the, young, the younger of them said to his father, 
Give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And, and, and not many days after the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, there, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal, meaning reckless, righteous living. He, was, he, he wasted everything that the father gave to him being reckless. He was reckless with what was given to him, right? But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to the citizens of that country, and he sent uh, him into his fields to feed the swine, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, the food ate, and, and not one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, who you should highlight that? But when he came to where? When he began to realize, to some degree, not all the way, like, who am I? Like, why am I out here about to eat with pigs? When he came to himself, he begins to trace back who he belongs to. Y'all hearing me? He starts to trace back who he belongs to. When he comes to himself, like, Father, help us to come to ourselves. Watch this. He said, now, how many of my father's hired? Now, notice he recognized that it was his father, but his guilt and condemnation is about to call, try to get him to reposition himself or to try to, um, you know, like change how he identifies himself. But watch what the father does. So. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he rose and he came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. His father saw him and had compassion. And the son said to him, Father, I, he repeated himself, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Notice this. His reckless living starts to affect with his identity, start to affect his identity or how he views himself. But the father said to his servants, I love this, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found and they begin to be merry. We'll stop here. I want to talk about today. I found you. I want to use that as a topic. I found you. This entire text reveals to us the passionate pursuit that God has for those who once belonged to him. I found you. Holy Spirit, help us now in Jesus' name. Um. So in the past, we talked about how God has uniquely made us and how he sees us and how we are treasured in his sight. But in this parable or in these parables in, in, in Luke 15, we get another glimpse into God's heart for us. And I want you to think about something. In each of these parables, all three lost represent in each story. They represented or, or a, a, they, they represented a highly or they were highly treasured. All three lost in each story were highly treasured. Highly treasured. I want you to think about that. I am highly treasured. I want you to say that I am highly treasured. I need you to get this in your heart. Not in just in your head, but in your heart. You're going to see why. I am highly treasured. I am highly treasured. The lost sheep represented a shepherd's life. Watch this. A shepherd's life a shepherd's love, and a shepherd's livelihood. The coin in this parable represented the woman's greatest treasure and security. The son, and how much 
more valuable could anything be to a parent than their relationship with and with the well-being of their own child? Highly treasured. And just like these three parables, the entire package of who you are, (laughs) you are, let me say it this way, you are of priceless worth to God. I want you to think about that. Like who would give their only begotten son? to redeem that which was lost back to himself, if what he wasn't going after was highly treasured to him. I want you to think about this in the series Right to Become, because so often, see, when you realize that you're highly treasured, you'll stop comparing yourself to other treasures. (laughs) When you realize how highly treasured you are, it begins to fix relationships. Because you'll start putting unnecessary pressure, pressure on people to convince you how treasured you are. Not that we don't like to hear good comments, look nice today and those things. But when you realize how highly treasured you are, you'll wake up with how you look when you wake up and still realize you're treasured. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. Sometimes you don't look too treasured when you wake up. But you're treasured. <laughs> you ain't brushed them teeth yet, but you're treasured. Rep don't smell like it, but you treasure. <laughs> Every single person is of enormous value to God. Now, when you get this, it'll even help you with your ministry. It'll help you with your bring around your coworkers. It will show you the importance and the value of sharing this great news, and that is that you are extremely valuable to God. And if you're lost, he's found you. Um, The reason every person is valued to God is not because of what we've done to earn or deserve it, but because of what God has done in us and for us. So no matter how loved, no matter how uniquely and purposefully we were made, we, we were all, watch this, We all were or all like lost sheep, lost coin, a lost son. Valuable, but out of place. Valuable, but out of place. We were actually described, according to the word, as being dead in the trespasses of our sins. Blinded to the truth of our condition. Condemned through unbelief in Christ. Without hope and without God in the world and perishing to the disease of sin. That's what the Bible says about all of us and the condition we were in prior to Christ finding us. We were lost. But one of the key parts of these parables, which which reveals the heart of the father and all three, watch this, all three owners deeply wanted back what they lost, and they passionately pursued it. Matter of fact, really quick, just, just look at what each owner they, 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 and, and father, in this case, did. Luke 5 and 4, 15 and 4, again, it says, What man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the 99 in the open field and go after the lost until he finds it? He pursues it until he finds it. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. And coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together, saying to them, Rejoice with me because I found my lost sheep. Like he don't just he don't just celebrate in his house. He'll go and tell everybody else. I need y'all to celebrate with me. Look at the heart that Jesus is trying to reveal con- the father that the father has concerning us. That when he found us, he wasn't just happy himself. He wanted everybody else to celebrate along with him. The lost coin uh, in verse eight and nine it says, "Or oh, what woman who has ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search?" Careful until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me because I found my silver coin. Most people be like, well, what's so special about that coin? You got a whole lot of other coins. 
But isn't it amazing? Because that also reveals that even though God may have a whole lot of other children, when he sees you, he sees you uniquely and fearfully made. And you have, watch this, just because you have a lot of other coins does not mean that the one coin has lost its value. I'm going to say it again, just because, because sometimes, you know, what happens just because you, you, you used to be the one, but now there's a eight other, nine other, or you used to be the only child, and now there's a few more children, and all of a sudden now you start to think that you are less valuable than the others that have come along, but not in God's household, not in the kingdom. That's what I love about God is because I don't have to be jealous about what God is doing in somebody else's life because God loves me. Just the same, uniquely, but just the same. Isn't it amazing that when God looks at you, his heart just bubbles and overflows and he almost loses it. And he looks at you and his heart bubbles and flows and almost loses it. And then he looks at you and it's the same thing. It's, this is, that's the love that God has for his children. I mean, think about it. Part of the reason that he hasn't returned yet is because he's still trying to recover what he lost. Have you thought about that? Like, like he's delayed. Like, it looks like the kingdom of darkness is winning. And God says, no, they're not winning. I, I'm just extending my grace because of what I'm looking for. Hold on, my children. I know it's tough for you, but I need you to hold on because we got to finish. We got to finish redeeming your other brothers and sisters. Man, God, we need you to help us to see. Verse 20 through 24, when he gets to the sun, he says, so he got up and went to his father. But while the sun was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. And he ran and threw his arms around his neck and he kissed him. And even though the sun goes into this spiel, like I'm no longer, I sinned against heaven and against you and in your sight. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. It's like the father puts him on disregard and says to his servants, quickly bring me the best robe. I don't put robes on servants. I don't put rings on servants. I don't put slippers on servants. I put it on sons. I know you had a rough past. I know you asked for your heritage and you left me. But watch what Jesus is trying to say. It's like the father doesn't even worry about all of that. He's just excited that his son is back home. I know you got a past. I know you were reckless with your life, but you are here. You were dead and now you are alive. Let's celebrate. I want you to write this down. If you are lost in any capacity... God wants you to be found in every capacity. If you are lost in any capacity, God wants you to be found in every capacity. Whatever it is that you feel lost in, God wants you to be found. <laughs> so listen, we were lost, but in Christ, we have been redeemed and restored. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21 says, so we are Christ ambassadors. This is the apostle writing. He says, God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead. Come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with him through Christ. So that we could be made right with him through Christ. There's another passage in Titus, the second chapter, verses 13 through 14. It says, our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, eager for good deeds. We were made right with God through Christ. And then not only that, we were redeemed from every lawless deed. Listen, this is grace. Prodigal. This is grace. <laughs> I love this. And not only is it grace, but it's where God wants us to stand and to establish our faith on. Okay. It's by grace that we come into our position and our identity in Christ. We might have been lost. We might have been reckless. We might have been a waste. You ever had somebody tell you that you were a waste? You wasted your life. 
You wasted time. I don't know why I wasted my time with you as if there was no value in who you were. And even though we might have, because one of the words for, rec, for, for prodigal is waste. And even though we might have wasted a lot of things and wasted a lot of time and, and bad, poor decisions put us in a position of waste, we are redeemed in Christ. And don't get mad at me because this is grace. And this is where God has called me to stand. This is where God wants me to establish my faith. Grace, this is where I come into my position and my identity in Christ. I'll give you one. Romans 5 verse 2 says, we have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. I read something and I want to read this to you. It really made me think when I was thinking about grace and I thought about the prodigal and, and, and really what God was trying to say as he culminated all those parables is this. The sun doesn't shine on us because we are so deserving of its light. The sun shines on us because it's, his, it's, it's nature to shine. I'm going to say it again. The sun does not shine on us because we are deserving of its light. The sun shines on us because its nature is to shine. And it will continue to shine. Watch this. Whether we ask it to, want it to, or deserve it. Grace. Grace is unearned, undeserved gift that is freely and generously poured out on a chosen recipient. Grace. Grace is not purchased. Grace is not earned or deserved or else it wouldn't be grace. Grace is never bought. It's bestowed. Watch this. <laughs> it flows. Grace flows out of the loving kindness and goodwill of, of whoever the giver is. You can think of grace like a river. A river continues to flow because of the nature of the source, not the worthiness of its destination. I'm going to say it again. A river flows not, I mean, it flows because of the nature of the source, not the worthiness of the destination. So when this river of God's grace pours out his love and thoughts concerning us, it's not because we've earned the right to be trusted. It's because God is always consistently himself. I'm going to say it again, because remember, I told you that when you know who God is, you'll know who you are. When God's grace the river of God's grace pours out of his love, or out his love and thoughts concerning us. It's not because we've earned the right to be trusted. It's because God is always himself consistently. This is why when the son said, I've sinned against heaven, I sinned against you. And he says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The father says, go get his robe, go get his, his, go get a ring, go get his slippers. Why? Because that's who I purposed you to be. Like you are my begotten. That's it, what you did doesn't change. You. I love. Thank you, Lord. What you do doesn't change who he is. Aren't you grateful that no matter what you've done with your life, it has never changed how consistent God has consistently God has been himself. This is something I'm having to get over. Because every time you, 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 you have a letdown or you, you feel like you failed at something or failed someone, if you're not careful, you'll start to get so down on yourself that you start to change how you identify with yourself. And God says, let me remind you, son, what you've done does not change who I am. Now, am I saying that God won't correct you? No, absolutely not. God loves those whom he chastens. But even if God is chastening you, it does not change who he is. And if it doesn't change who he is, it doesn't change how he feels concerning you. This is the problem that God had with Israel when they found themselves going into bondage for 70 years. He said, this is not the thought. I know the thoughts and the plans that I think towards you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil and to give you an expected end. And this is why they could hold on. Now, some might have perished in the time. But at some point, God was going to come back and redeem his people. Why? Because he cannot be in consistent with who he is listen what I'm saying is that he doesn't forgive us because we are so forgivable 
I know you were thinking that, yep, God forgave me because I did. No, you did nothing. He didn't forgive you because you were forgivable. But because he is so merciful and forgiving. He doesn't love us because we're so lovable. (laughs) But rather because he is so loving. Okay, man, you got to get this in your heart. No, I keep saying your head. You got to get this in your heart because some of us, you are you despise yourself when God loves you dearly. Watch this. What do I do? Accept it. Why? It's grace. God showed me. This is what we do because when we make the mistakes, we mess up, or we find things. We say, okay, well, what do I got to do to work? And God says, wait a minute, you can't do that. Because there's nothing that you could do that will make me any different or make me feel. You can do all the stuff you want to do for me, but it doesn't make me love you more. You can do, you can respond and, and you do everything you want to do and it won't make me want to do anything anymore. Like if I wasn't planning on doing it, I'm not going to do it. As a matter of fact, I already know what you're going to do. <laughs> we got another song that we wrote. We're working on call. I am. We sung it here one time. I am who I am because he is who he is. I am who I am because he is who he is. Listen, Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 5 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, meaning compassion and pity, because of his great love, With which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. By what? By grace, you have been saved. Now, I'm going to come back to verse 6. But I want to point out to you that Paul says, watch this, that the reason that God did it. This is verse 7. That God did it this way. God saved us by grace. Watch this. So that in the coming ages, this is verse 7, Ephesians 2 and 7, he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Wait a minute. God saved us by grace because so, so that in the coming ages, he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to me and his kindness to you. He wants to put his grace on display. Now, this is so important. Why? Because he's coming to find sinners. He's coming to find publicans and sinners. They didn't get it. He's coming to find those who think at times, and they might, we we all did. We all deserved to die. We all deserve the wrath of God. But God is, but it's very difficult. You you ever tried, and some of you might even be this way, uh, or find yourself here. It's very difficult to try to convince someone about life when they feel like they, they deserve death. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's very difficult to convince somebody that there's better when they feel like, no, I deserve worse. So God says, hey, the reason I did it by grace is because I want to display, I love this, uh, the immeasurable riches of my grace. And I want want people to see it through you. That means that when you go back home and people say, man, you was a wreck. You was a mess, boy. You was trifling. You did a whole lot of stuff. But they look at you and go, how in the world did you make it? How in the world did he chose to use you? And God says, see, yes, I'm displaying my immeasurable riches of my grace. I want them to understand. See, this is the thing. We preach good news, good news, good news. But do you know what the good news is? The good news is that there is a holy, righteous, just God who wants to display his immeasurable riches of his grace. And he wants to give you salvation by grace. So, yes, even though you deserve death, even though you you, you were trifling, even though you were by nature, the scripture says, children of disobedience and and children of wrath, God says, but I want them to look at you and say, well, if he can save you, he can definitely save me. That's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are the good news. Y'all ain't hearing me. When they can look at your life and they'll say, man, look, that is good news. (laughs) My grandmother, she said, baby, oh, this is, I work hard. Bless the Lord. By his grace, you are saved. 
Ephesians 2 and 7, the New Living Translation says this. So God can point to us in all the future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us and shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. See, we got to get this because when we get this and we understand the grace of God, we'll be a little more gracious to others. We'll get to the point where we understand just because they don't do it like you or like you, the way you like, they're still okay. <laughs> Ephesians 3 and 10, I found that to be very interesting here, says God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. In other words, God's been planning for our lives, our salvation, our forgiveness, our new identity, and position in him to be a public display of his loving grace. I'm going to say it one more time. God's plan from the beginning before you ever did anything. God's plan was for our lives, our salvation, our forgiveness, and our new identity and positioning him to be a public display of his loving grace. So in other words, your story of your redeemed life is to be like an in your face to the kingdom of darkness. As his grace is the resource, I love this, to help us overcome the shaming effects and power of sin. Okay. Like Satan is the accuser of the brethren. So what he does is, and this is what he thought he had, God. You're just, you're righteous. They break your law. You have to be a just judge. So I'm going to fix it where you have to judge and, 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 and condemn the ones you love. He thought he had God. God says, well, wait, what you didn't know is that my son, the Lamb of God, was slain before the foundation of the world. And what I'm going to give them is a power that you can't take away. It's called my grace. No, y'all, watch this, watch this. So when you come before me and you accuse Angela, when you accuse Anthony, when you accuse Tanya, when you come before me accusing them, my grace covers them. But it doesn't just cover. My grace gives them the power to overcome your accusation. My grace gives them the power to overcome the shaming effects and the power of sin. So usually when somebody says you're guilty, you know you're guilty, then you just, you're down and you're done. But God's grace, when you understand it, says, you know what? But I can get up. Why? Because I have God's grace. So my grace is going to be their power to overcome the shaming effects and the power of sin. Sin will put you down, but God's grace says, come on, get up while there's still time. Come on, get up. If you open your eyes today, I told you repentance is a gift. It's not something to run, run from. It's rather something to run to. Jesus gave us the right to become. Tyrone, who you think you are? Jesus gave me the right to become. Jesus gave me the privilege to become. Jesus gave me the benefit to become. Jesus gave me the authority to become. Who do you think you are coming out of that place, coming out of Southern Pines and thinking, Jesus gave me the privilege because he gave me his grace, and it's by grace that I'm saved. See, when you understand it's by grace, you'll, you'll be quick to worship. You'll be quick to praise. You'll be quick to say thank you, God, because you realize there's nothing I've done to deserve what you're doing in my life. I was telling a young man the other day, you don't understand, I serve out of my gratitude. Are you hearing me? Because I see the grace of God. I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be called to do what I'm doing right now, but it's by his grace. I shouldn't be in position to be, watch this, to be rewarded for serving him because really I don't deserve to serve him. And really I don't have the power in and of myself to do what I'm doing, but it is by his grace. 
So it's by his grace I lift my hands, I sing my song, I rejoice, because I'm supposed to be in a devil's hell. But by his grace I am saved. You know, right? You know what, Satan? You're right. I love this. The Bible says when the adversary comes, agree with him quickly. So when the enemy comes and says, you know what? But you, you are right. I was. And yes, I did. I did that. I did this. But by his grace, I am standing. Y'all ain't hearing me. It is in this grace that I stand. And that's what my life is built on. That's what leads me to getting out of whatever I'm in. It is by his grace. Grace, how you overcome by his grace? How did you overcome that, uh, y- y- the, the condemnation by his grace? Isn't that what Jesus demonstrated when he was on the earth? He finds a young woman. She's caught in the very act of adultery. He says to them, he says, you who has no sin, cast the first stone, right? And then he says to her, now get up, go your way and sin no more. But what did he just demonstrate? God's grace. Grace is not so you can stay in whatever you in. Grace is so that you can get out. That's why people have such a hard time with grace, because we think grace is a license to sin. No, Paul says it's not a license to sin. It's a license to overcome. God's grace. When you understand God's grace, you won't hang out and think you just got a lot of time because you know it's undeserving. When you understand God's grace, he can say time's up at any time. But while I'm in God's grace, I got time. I'm moving. I'm acting every day. I'm trying to position myself to live according to what he's called me to. Why? Because I'm living in his grace. Somebody shout grace. Through our life and our salvation, God looks to show the world that he and his grace is absolutely amazing. And it's to be praised. When you read the first chapter of Ephesians, it's it's to the praise of his glory. It's to the praise of his glory. Beloved, it's to the praise of his glory. That grace leads to the praise of his glory. So we in our new identity are to become living proof. That's what God wants to witness. We're living proof. And Christian, listen, let me say this. This Christian life, it's not about what you've done. It's about what God has done. It's not about what we've earned or deserve. It's about his grace. So what should we do? Seek those things which are where? Above. Look at Colossians really quick. Colossians, the third chapter, verse one. The first thing we got to do is just accept it. Like sometimes we get in here and, and don't get me wrong. We said this revelation is to lead to action, but you got to get revelation first before you start trying to act. What happens with the church and the reason we get burnt out and we get tired is because we're trying to act with no revelation. So we're trying to do and do and do and God hasn't even revealed anything to you what to do. The first thing we need to do is to see and receive. You are not who your circumstances has defined you of. You are not Because if that's the case, anybody can define you. Anybody can identify or try to give you an identity. If you fail at what they look for you to do, they're going to give you an identity and call you a failure. If 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 they if they got problems with whatever the case may be, whatever their interaction with you, they're going to give you a name. You won't find who you are. Thank you, Holy Ghost. You won't find who you are in, let me see how to say it. You won't find who you are by what you're going through. Now, you can find who you are in what you're going through, but not by what. Meaning God can reveal to you who you are through what's going on around you. But what's going on around you does not define you. Are y'all are you tracking like God can use an experience to give you a revelation of who you are. But God identified you. God told you, be very careful that you don't allow the circumstances around you to try to give you identity. And so many people do. And we said this. 
They go searching for themselves in what they do. And when they fail, they also embrace that experience as well. So that's why your past, your record, your whatever the case may be, if you're not careful, it will try to label you. But it cannot. It doesn't have <sighs> the only ability it has to define you is what you give it. Are you with me? The only one that has the right to define you is the one that created you. The only one that has the authority to tell you who you are is the one that made you. Everything else needs your agreement. Everything else needs your acceptance. But there's only one that does not need your acceptance to define you. Now, you may not walk in it when he reveals it to you, but it is what it is when he says it. So what do we do? Colossians 3 and 1 says, if you then were raised with Christ, we saw that in Ephesians 6. That's what Ephesians 6 said. I said, we'll come back to it. It says that we've been raised up to sit together with Christ in heavenly places, right? That's what we've been positioned, right? In Christ, we've been raised to identify and be with Christ in heavenly places. So now Paul writes to the church of Colossae and says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things where? On the earth. I love this. The, uh, another translation says it this way. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. Well, Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Another one says, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your somebody say hearts on the things above. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your heart. I love that. Set your heart. Now, let me say this. We have to get our mind and our hearts set on what Christ has accomplished. That's why I started all the way to. We have to get our heart and our mind set. Now, we say we don't know how, but we really do. Because if you look at your everyday life, whenever you set your heart on something, you're going to do it. Whatever your mind is made up, you are into. You know how to set your heart on what you know how to set your heart on. It don't care when your heart is set. It don't care what people say. It don't care what you're going to do, what you have set your to do, what you have set your mind to do. The principle is the same. Set your heart on things above. Why on things above? Because that's where the record is clear. <laughs> Hear me. You want to set your heart and your mind on the things above because they're not defiled there. You want to set it on the things above because what's below your heart will be all. That's part of our problem is we've set our heart on too many things below. And we got all kinds of junk and stuff in our heart that's affecting the way that we live and we move and we have our being. But when you set your heart on the things above where Christ is, meaning what Christ has accomplished, and you receive the grace of God, and you stop trying to convince, work yourself into righteousness, where you stop trying to convince yourself by what you do or what you've done or what you didn't do, whether you are righteous or not. You cannot make yourself right. You can be as good as all get out. But everything you do still doesn't make you righteous. There is none righteous, not one. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And whether it's a past sin or yesterday's sin, you still fall short without his grace. Set your affections. Listen, if we don't learn to set our mind and our heart on what Christ has accomplished, we can't appropriate it. We can't act on it. Therefore, we can't live it out. Set your affections above. See, there's a reason that we have to renew our mind. Because he restored our image. But we have to allow his word to restore our thinking. Listen, life can have a way of stretching and testing who you are on the earth. 
I'm going to say it that way for a reason. Life has a way of stretching and testing who you are on the earth. As a matter of fact, the greatest test of our identity often come when major situations hit our life. Like, I'll give you an example. Here's three. In Genesis 37, years later, I mean, had that not been enough, years later, another tragic storm hits his life. After being falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, he was stripped of all he earned. And watch this. And then he was unjustly in prison. His reputation as a trusted servant and all of his privileged roles and responsibilities were immediately gone. Watch this. Who are you now, dreamer? Hmm? Look at what life has done. You had a dream, huh? You started off. God's going to do what God's going to do. Let me tell you about what God told me. Let me tell you what God. You know, you ever, you ever started a place where you got a little prophecy, your life started getting together, man? You was living, you was living right. So, I mean, you was living holy. You was doing the, you was, boy, you was the first at church. His prayer, life was good. You would be quick to prophesy, encourage people, everything. And then all of a sudden, life hit. Where are you now, dreamer? Now, Even though I'm sure that Joseph battled with who he was at this moment. Watch this. Did he have. I'm pretty sure as he as he he finds this place, he finds this moment. But also, I'm pretty sure he battled. Well, did he even have a purpose for living? I had a dream. This happened. That happened. Where is God? Why am I even here? I'm going to spend the rest of my life in Pharaoh's prison. For something I didn't do, trying to be faithful to a God that has led me into this situation. Hmm. But I have a question for you. Did what he experienced change his identity? With God. It changed it with those around him. Can you imagine him in prison? Yeah, I had a dream. Well, (laughs) so much for your dream. (laughs) <laughs> now let me tell you who you are you are a prisoner you're not even a traffic slave anymore you are a prisoner look at this situation could it could have identified him you are a failed prisoner you don't even have no heritage did his experience change what he was purposed for in the earth no We can find another situation in the book of Ruth. There was an elderly woman by the name of Naomi. She experienced a lot of trauma. And in the process of her family trying to survive a famine, her husband and both her sons died, leaving her in a foreign land without support. She was no longer a wife or a mother. Naomi was left in poverty with no direction and no sense of her own purpose and value. Matter of fact, when people greeted her by name, this is what she said, Ruth 1, 23-21, when they greeted her by name, She said, do not call me Naomi. Now notice how she is allowing her circumstance to change her. Her name meant pleasant. She tells them, don't call me Naomi, but call me Mara, meaning bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. She had, watch this, she had gotten to the point where she was now allowing her circumstance to define who she was. She says, I went away full, and the Lord brought me back empty. See, the truth is, many times intense grief and losses will bring us to a point of identity crisis. And this is what gets in the head. This is what causes so much the mental health issues that we're having right now. It's really, who are we? Because grief and loss and disappointment and all these things that have happened to me in life have me lost. I don't know who I am. I don't even know why I'm here. Have you ever responded to tragedy like that? Listen, life, no matter how tragic and hard it may be, does not have the ability to change who and what you're destined for. This is why God gives us these stories. These aren't just made up stories. These are, let me say this way. This is why God gives us these testimonies. 
This is why he didn't record Naomi's hardships just to make an open show out of her. You know why he did it? It goes back to what I said from Ephesians. God wanted to display his grace. So that when life or when the enemy comes to you and try to make you think that you have no purpose for being here, that look at your life, you are wrecking a mess. You can say, well, wait a minute, Naomi, that wasn't her situation. She ended up being uh, one that brought about the grandparents of David. She got into the lineage of the Messiah. <laughs> so the question is, how have you responded to tragedy and loss in your past? How have you responded to harsh criticism or false accusations? Have you been betrayed by a friend or passed over for a position or, or honor that you thought you deserved and didn't get it? In the midst of your disappointment, did, you, did it cause you to fall apart in a storm of confusion, questioning God's goodness and your own sense of value and purpose? If so, it's okay because other people did too. But I have great news. Your circumstance, your trial... And even your frustration and questioning didn't change anything. Oh, listen, listen. What, isn't it a blessing to know that what you've gone through didn't change anything with God? He knew you were going to go through it before you did, and he still purposed you to be great. Listen. He knew that you would fail the times you did. Isn't it a blessing to know? This is why I thank God when you get to know his heart and know his mind. Because even though he knew I would make all the bonehead decisions I would make and do all the stupid stuff I would do, he still called me to do this. He still called to use me. He still said, man, I am well pleased. I remember I got a prophecy, and now it makes so much sense. I had just started in ministry, and God used the prophet. I didn't notice that the Lord says he is well pleased with you. You know what I thought? What did I do? All I did was say yes. I, ain't did, I haven't done anything yet. I just said yes. And God says, that was enough. Because you was lost, and I found you. Aren't you, isn't it good news to hear that his counsel still stands for your life? That even though this might have happened and people wrote you off, that God is saying when you opened your eyes, he's looking at you and said, nothing's changed. Now get up. Let's go. Come on, walk closer to me. But God, I'm tired of failing. That's because you're not walking. Walk closer to me. God, I'm tired of feeling this place. Get out. Get out of that bed. Get out of that place. Walk closer to me. Walk because the closer you get to me, the closer you get to me, the more you'll, uh, you'll, you'll see another side of me that'll change you. Just keep getting, just keep walking. But God, I feel like I can't, but you're doing it. God, I feel like, but you still walk. Just keep walking. Just keep walking. Keep. That's a sign of your repentance. You turned from where you were going and now you're walking to me. Keep coming because who you are in Christ still stands this is why you have to set your affections and your heart on the things above where Christ sits because that's where who you are is affirmed and established by his grace I got another one for you think about it Job lost everything he shaved his head fell to the ground and said naked came I from my mother's womb and naked I shall return but you know what? I thought about something. Job had gotten something right. He got down to the core of who God was and realized that he had nothing to hang on to but God. Listen, you ever wonder why God's greatest commandment has always been for you to love him with your entire being? Like, Love the Lord. The first part is love the Lord with all of thy heart. Love the Lord with your total identity. Why would you say that? Well, because, watch this. In the scripture, the heart is referenced as the innermost part of your being that guides and influences everything else in your life. That's Proverbs 4 and 23. Your heart 
It's the central headquarters where all of your true beliefs and your innermost thoughts and your deepest values and your greatest desires and your future plans and the root decisions uh, originate and reside. Listen, it's out of your heart that you both love or hate. It's out of your heart that you have joy or sorrow. Bitterness and forgiveness can reside in your heart. Both truth and lies can be spoken and rooted in your heart. Our entire lives are affected by the condition of our heart. That's why Jesus said it's out of the abundance of the heart. The mouth speaks. What defiles you is what comes from where? Your set your heart on the things above. The core beliefs in our hearts lead us to the thoughts that we think in our minds, which guide the words that we speak with our lips, which lead the ways that we live out our lives. The daily deeds we do and resulting, watch this, and the resulting fruit of our impact in the world is predicated on the condition of our heart. This is why he wants you to wrestle with who you are in your heart. Because if he can get it in your heart and etched in your heart, he'll get it to come out of your life. And he understands, watch this. Jeremiah 17 and 10 says this. I, I the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. But God searches where? The heart. So the condition of your heart is vitally important, and we must watch where we set it. We got to get to a place where we stand in the grace of God, and from that place, guard what's in our Hearts. Proverbs 123 actually says, watch over your heart with all diligence from it flows the springs of your life. Your heart, if you're not careful, due to the circumstances around you, can change how you identify yourself on earth. But watch this. It can never change your identity in heaven. And this is the grace of God. And this is the blessing of God. Because as long as you are alive and you can repent, watch this, as long as you can go to God in prayer. What are you talking about? Father, thy kingdom come, thy will be on earth as it... I thank God for what is in heaven. I thank God for the what is. I thank God that he never changed what is. Because no matter what I've gone through, as long as I can get to my knees and access what is, then I can get my mind straight. I can get my heart straight. I can. That's why prayer is so powerful when you understand it. Because, you see, our problem is you want to take a lot of what's going on and take it into heaven. God says, no, 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 I don't want what's down there up here. I want what's up here down there. So when you come to me, come asking me what is. Don't tell me what's going on. Ask me what is. Because what is will change what's going on. So watch this. It's crazy. Job, he sees himself, I'm pretty sure, after he lost his 10 kids and all of his resources and wealth. The Bible had talked about one point. He was the most favored and blessed man of the East. I'm pretty sure that Job at some point started feeling some kind of way and saying, man, I don't even know if that's true anymore. Watch this. But God continues to say in the midst of Job's situation that there's none like him on all the earth. Blameless and upright. Fearing God and turning away from evil. Isn't it amazing? You might be speaking one way about yourself and God is speaking to your enemy in a totally different way. And Satan is trying to watch this. He's trying to he knows he can't convince God of anything else other than what he said. He's just trying to get God to judge you. And, and while he's going, look at that, look at look at Isaac, look at his life, look at what he's going through. Look. And God is saying, yes, he's a, a favorite and highly upright man. And it's crazy because when you hear it, you go, no, I'm not. I mean, I, you don't understand what I'm going through. God says, no, but you don't know who you are. And if I can ever get you to realize who you are in the midst of what you're going through, then I can make an open show and mockery to the enemy to say, watch this. I told you I knew who Job was. 
I told you Job wouldn't deny me. I told you he wouldn't blaspheme against me. At some point, Satan, you're going to shut up and listen because I'm God. I'm, I know who he is, and I know what he has in him. Listen, when Job, Joseph, and Naomi's identity on earth was robbed, their identity in heaven never changed. Okay, Pastor, but I'm here. You're right, you are. But if you set your affections on things above, in the midst of what you're going through, and grab a hold to the grace of God, walk in it, receive it, share it, so that everyone that sees, so that everyone can see what the kindness of God has done for you. The Lord spoke to me, says, man, Walk in my grace and win. Get up and win. And that's what I'm telling you today. You came in here feeling one way. You may walk out feeling the same way. That does not change who you are. Sometimes you're going to feel like you can win some. Sometimes you're going to feel like you're going to lose some. But watch this. The truth of what God has established it's not found in how you feel. It's found in what he says. And let me help you out. Sometimes you don't have time to prime yourself. You know, we prime ourselves in praise. I feel, I'm going to put on the garment of praise. Sometimes you ain't got time to sing a bunch of songs before you're going to face what you're facing. Sometimes in the midst of how you feel, you got to grab onto the reality of who you are. And you're going to lose. Meaning you'll have losses in your life, but if you hold on, you won't lose the battle. Never look for Satan to give you a break. Like, this isn't fair. You, you ever gotten a fight? You, you, and they haul off and they suck upon you. Too. This ain't fair. You suck. They don't matter now. You're fighting. And why is it saints we're looking for fair fights? The enemy, the enemy, it ain't fair. He does not like you. I say this all the time. Let's get this down. Satan, the kingdom of darkness, they hate your guts. They're not going to give you a break. So stop looking for your opposition to give you a break. What do you do? Fight back. Fight back. I've learned this is true in many ways, I, I was talking to a guy who's a former, um, it might have been either SEAL or a uh, ranger. I asked him about the concept of slicing, the, they call it slicing the pie, I believe it is. That whenever you're taking, like, fire, the way that you shut it down is you fire back and you push for it. So if you watch, the, the, you watch any of the movies, you'll see them, they'll move in units, and when they'll go, Walk together and shoot this way, right? Because what happens is when you're bringing the fight to your enemy, he backpedals. Y'all ain't hearing me, saints. See, this is what we do. We want God to give us a break so we can finish enjoying life. God says you are in a war. When you wake up, it ain't about a break. It's about bringing the fight. If you want the, in you want the pressure off, then bring the fight to your enemy. Like one of them days where you woke up and you just start going off in prayer <laughs> and you start decreeing what's going to happen. Not after he's gotten you. See, this is how we do. The enemy attacks the old devil. You done messed up now. No. <laughs> Get up and go at him. The Bible says that the gates of hell shall not. The church, you, you, we, 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 God's people are supposed, Jesus was never on the defensive. Every day he was on the offensive. He was taking ground. You don't like what's happening in your community? Be on the offensive. You don't like what's happening with the kids in school? Be on the offensive. This is a shame. We're in a time right now that the church, we're just backpedaling, backpedaling, backpedaling. Defense, why are they doing this? They're taking this away. They're doing that. What are we doing? Oh, I get it. We just want to have our good life now. We just want, come on, can we get a break? We want a vacation. Can we get a break? We want to hang out. Can we get a break? And while we're taking breaks, guess what's happening? The kingdom of darkness is advancing. 
and he's making the, making the world smaller for your children to live for God, making it harder for you to live for God. He's just taking away ground because the church isn't being on the offensive. We just walk around trying to figure out what our purpose is. And what we don't realize is that you are purpose in a body. You are the thought of God wrapped in flesh. You are the heart of God wrapped in a body. You are here because God, project, he needed you to be here at this time for this reason. When the fall of man happened, vacation was over. <laughs> Adam messed that up. That won't happen until it's all said and done. We have a real enemy now. And he wants you to not know who you are. And he's going to use every circumstance or situation. He's going to use every offense, every uh, 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 anything that comes against you to challenge how you see yourself. But if you keep, and yes, that man, it's tough. You have to keep resetting your thoughts. You have to keep resetting your, your focus, your gaze. It is so easy to get distracted. I do, it happens all the time to me. I, God, why am I still telling them this? Why am I still preaching? And then I have to reset my, my affections, things above. And then, you know what blessed me? I was just sharing with my wife and some few, a few friends that I got a hold of the grace of God. Man, when you start to look at and understand the grace of God, it will change you. You'll, you'll, you'll become, like, more grateful. Like, you... You, you'll start giving, watch this, you'll start giving situations and people the benefit of the doubt when truthfully they don't even deserve it. You know why? Because you realize you didn't deserve it. Then God will start opening your eyes and you'll see things and see people differently. You'll stop being so offended by their actions towards you because you'll start to see where they are and how hurt they are in their own life. And then you'll realize that, well, no matter what they say, they can't change who I am. So I can be consistent in who I am in their life, no matter how they feel. And I'm not saying it doesn't hurt. I'm not saying it doesn't hurt when people talk about you, bring false accusations against you, don't want nothing to do with you. Yes, you're human and it hurts. And God made you with emotions. But you know what your emotions are? It's for setting your affections on the things above. Because emotions, they will move you. Many times we do or don't do because of how we feel. But if we can understand how to reset, recalibrate. That's hence the reason he says, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That when you're broken, shift your emotions. You know how you do that? It's not easy. If you put your mind and your eyes on him. What are you looking at? I just can't stand this. This is so mad. Well, stop looking at it all day long. <laughs> oh, did you just get on me? Cause you, well, how'd you find it out? On Facebook. Well, get off of it. <laughs> Put your mind somewhere else. Put your heart somewhere else. And when you put your heart somewhere else, your actions will be different. Listen. Rejoice. Because he found you. And no matter what you're going through, you belong to him. Stand to your feet.